Dr. Schaefer, thanks for joining us here again on Health Connection. This is a topic that people think about all the time, yes, obesity. Indeed. Is it genetics or is it willpower is the question. And so let's just get right into it. Is being overweight a matter of just eating fewer calories than you burn or is there something else going on? Well, as a first approximation, it is a matter of eating less than what your, your body needs. There, there's no getting around that, that basic uh, premise. And what we can look back to in the question of, of genetics or, 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 or family history or willpower is that we know 50 years ago we would not be having this discussion because the majority of the population did not have a weight problem. But just since I've started practice in the past quarter century, we've gone from 20% of the population being overweight to over a third of them being overweight. We know the genetics of the population has not changed. So something other than genetics is influencing the, the fact that the population is becoming more and more obese. The, the way we distill this, however, is that uh, genetics actually probably work in a way to induce obesity when the environment changes. And we know that there have been environmental changes in the past 20 years compared to, to 50 years ago. Well, I think you segued into our next question. Do your genes, does your family history affect whether or not you put on weight, become overbeast, and what are the environmental factors that play a role in, in obesity? Hundreds, even thousands of studies have shown that if obesity runs in your family, you're more likely to become obese. Twin studies in which twins are separated at birth, if uh, one is obese living in California and the other's living in New York in a completely different situation, if one's obese, the other's going to be obese. If one's lean, the other will be lean. So even though the environments are different, the the genes are identical in that particular situation, telling us that genetics are a very powerful influence. Now, in either of those individuals in California or New York, if they were in a setting where they were burning more calories or had less access to food, they would not become obese. So if they're in a permissive environment in which they're able to eat more food, they will become overweight because there are genes in our, in our DNA that can predispose us to becoming obese if we are in an environment in which we have ready access to calories. So if you, genetically, you can, if you're predisposed toward it and you're in an environment that is conducive to it, then you're going to be more likely to put on weight than somebody. More who. likely to put on weight. And, and the problem is we are almost all in an environment today in which we're more likely to, to put on weight because of easy access to calories. We hardly have to lift a finger to uh, accomplish our, our day's work. Uh, in contrast to generations ago in which people burned up as much calories to uh, do the day's work as, as they took in. There was a, a, a closer match. In fact, uh, when we were an agrarian economy, individuals actually ate more than they ate today, but they burned a lot more calories right. than they burned today. Right. Let's get a definition. What is, a, what is metabolism? And is it fair to say that some people have a fast metabolism and some people have a slow metabolism? Metabolism is the rate at which we burn energy. You might think of a, a car that has a, a two-barrel carburetor will not burn gasoline as fast as a car with a, a four-barrel carburetor. Some people can, are very metabolically efficient and are able to um, maintain weight with just a small number of calories, and others are, um, have a faster metabolism less metabolically efficient, and they require more calories to do the same amount of work. So there are differences. They're not drastic, but it turns out that a difference in metabolic rate of even 1% is enough over the course of, uh, of a lifetime to make a difference of 50, 100, or 150 pounds of excess uh, weight. Interesting. 
Some scientists believe that genetic disorders are the primary reason people are overweight. Others believe the easy availability of calories, as you just said, and high fat foods and lack of exercise are responsible for the obesity epidemic. Which group is correct? Well, they, they are both correct, which is not uh, entirely satisfying, but uh, we have only been able to find very rare cases where there is a, an obvious genetic defect leading to severe weight gain. So and that affects maybe one out of 5,000 people in the population. However, there, have, there are up to 50 different genes which have been identified as being associated with increasing the risk for obesity in an environment in which people are able to eat more and exercise less. So if you're unlucky enough to get more than your share of these obesity genes, then you will gain weight more easily than, uh, than a person in the same environment who does not have that, that complement of uh, these obesity risk genes. In reading articles about obesity and genetics, you frequently see the term twin studies. What does that mean? There are lots of different types of twin studies which are, are very informative. One example of a twin study uh, is a, a study in which they, they took um, 20, 20 groups of identical twins, put them in a controlled environment, and gave them all an extra thousand calories of food per day over, above and beyond what they would, they would need. Everyone in the study gained weight, but the range of weight gain was, was uh, varied by a factor of 100 percent. The least weight gain was about 10 pounds, the greatest amount of weight gain was 20 pounds. So these individuals were observed, the food was delivered, uh, the scientists knew exactly what they were eating but some people gained more than others. So we know that there, there's something different about those individuals that gained more weight with the same amount of caloric intake. And so they, these individuals probably had you know, a greater complement of these genes that predispose to obesity, which may mm. be a slower metabolic rate or certain hormones which increase appetite or uh, prevent us from recognizing satiety or feeling full as quickly as we should. So that's a good example of twin studies. Okay. What is leptin and why is it referred to as the uh, obesity hormone? Well, leptin is a hormone made by fat cells. As you, as you eat and become full, your leptin levels will increase, telling you to quit eating. There are rare genetic uh, disorders first identified in, in mice and, and rat models in which uh, these animals did not produce leptin and they had, they were very, very morbidly obese. They actually identified uh, human, uh, a, a few examples in which the same genetic mutation existed in which leptin, uh, the leptin levels were abnormally low. When you gave either the, the mice or the ind individuals leptin, their appetite went back to normal and they lost weight. When leptin was first discovered, everyone thought, well, we have finally found the obesity hormone. All we have to do is uh, produce leptin and start giving people leptin injections to decrease their appetite and help them lose weight. It turns out that uh, individuals that are overweight, 99.9% .9 actually already have high leptin levels. Mm. We would have hoped they would have had low levels that we could uh, augment mm -hmm. and decrease their weight. So it turns out the most common forms of obesity in the United States and the world are probably due to leptin resistance. Individuals that are overweight have high leptin levels, but the body is somehow resistant to oh. its own, uh, to these leptin levels. So we have to figure out ways to counter leptin resistance, which is a, a tougher nut to crack than just giving people leptin. Well, while we're on the subject of uh, hormones, what is the hunger hormone? The hunger hormone is a hormone called ghrelin, G-H-R-E-L-I-N, which is produced solely by the stomach. Leptin is produced by all fat cells. Ghrelin is produced by the stomach. Now, normally, the ghrelin levels will cycle during the day. They'll go up 
before mealtime, signaling that it is it's time to eat. And then after we finish uh, uh, a meal, the leptin levels will go down. Well, some individuals, it, it was speculated, produce too much leptin or their leptin levels never get back down to normal, predisposing to obesity. And indeed, there is one genetic disorder called the Prader-Willi syndrome associated with morbid obesity, weights in excess of, of even 400 pounds, in which we can improve, decrease their appetite, and help them uh, lose weight by, uh, by giving them ghrelin. And uh, it's helpful in those situations. The vast majority of the population, however, just uh, uh, doing things to um, diminish the ghrelin levels will not, uh, does not have any bearing on weight. With the one exception being gastric bypass. I mentioned that ghrelin is produced by the stomach. Uh -huh. In gastric bypass, you remove most of the stomach. Or in the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, 80 or 90 percent of, of the stomach is removed. When you remove uh, the stomach, or most of it, that you remove the, the source of ghrelin, which decreases appetite, decreases that signal to eat. And it is speculated that one reason people with gastric bypass have such dramatic improvements in their metabolic parameters or blood sugar within just weeks or days of surgery, even before they lose weight, is because the ghrelin, the source of ghrelin, has been removed from their system. So it, it both leptin and ghrelin do provide insights into hormone systems that can be used to advantage to try to develop drugs that we might be able to use to, to help control weight. Giving the hormones themselves or blocking the hormones don't appear to be successful, but it does provide a clue into uh, some of the mechanisms that control appetite. You just mentioned gastric bypass. That is one of the tools that people use, that, that medicine uses to control obesity. Based on what we know, what are the best tools to combat obesity? Well, the the of course, uh, it's almost trite to say it, but the best tool is prevention. So starting when, when kids are young before they become obese. The, the longer we wait to intervene, the more difficult it is to make a difference. It's, it's obviously a lot more difficult to help someone who uh, weighs two or three times their normal weight to get to a desirable weight than it is to prevent someone from, from gaining 10 or 20 pounds. And indeed, one of the approaches that seems to be in favor now is to not focus so much on weight loss, but preventing weight gains, weight gain in increased populations. That being said, the most um, important tool that we have is to eat more and, and, and move more, exercise more. Uh, drugs really don't hold the answer. There are new medications which have come out, but they only promote maybe 5 or 10 percent uh, weight yeah. loss, which sometimes is enough to help improve diabetes, but most people that are 40 or 50 percent overweight, uh, they don't want 5 or 10 percent. They want, they want to have close to a desirable body weight, or at least get halfway there, so that their health, both their health is improved and their uh, appearance is improved. It's useful to have a coach, whether that's a health care provider or it could be a non-medical person, but someone you can be accountable to, and, and uh, this is a lifelong struggle. It's not something you accomplish in two weeks, four weeks, or one year, but this is, it requires a, a change in lifestyle uh, in perpetuity. Why is it such a struggle? You mentioned the word. What makes it such a struggle? Well, we are hardwired to do whatever it takes to survive as a species. If we if we don't have enough air or oxygen, if we can't breathe, we're going to do whatever it takes to breathe. If our, if our bodies sense that we are not getting adequate nutrition, then the signaling is, is turned on full bore to eat more food. Unfortunately, uh, and this is called the thrifty gene hypothesis, we're, we're hard, hardwired to, to eat when food is available. Hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, when individuals were, when it was a hunter-gatherer uh -huh. type of environment, individuals might eat well only two weeks out of four. The only ones that survived were those that could go two weeks without eating, who were able to fast, who were metabolically efficient and could 
store calories, could overeat, store those calories until, so that they would last until the next time they had access to food. Those are the individuals that survived to populate the planet today. So most of us have these thrifty genes. We don't need those anymore. They, they, don't, they don't serve us because, serve us well because we have access to food 24 seven. Uh -huh. It's not an every two week affair or an every one week. Uh, we can now eat as often or as frequently as we want. We have prehistoric bodies in a, in a, <laughs> in a modern environment and, and the two are, are, are out of sync. Well, going forward, in the future, what role do you think genetics will play in the uh, future treatment and management of obesity? I think genetics will be extremely important. Now that we've uh, isolated the, the human genome, we know the genetic blueprint, uh, we've been able to identify those genes that are associated with an increased risk of weight gain. We can uh, identify their, their, their gene products, the, the particular hormones that are produced by those genes, like, like leptin or ghrelin, and try to determine the, the, the chemical signature that causes this to have thrifty genes or create this desire to overeat. And once we can do that, then we can uh, develop uh, pharmaceuticals that can block or, or inhibit those in a safe sort of way. Now this is going to be long term. It'll probably take a generation to, to mm -hmm. do this, find these safe drugs. We really don't have them yet. What we have now are, are things that have been available for a long time and just used in a different sort of way. So, so an understanding of, um, of our molecular biology will be the, the most important clue to a, a pharmaceutical approach to helping people with weight management. But the other part, which is, I think most people would say the most important part, is, is somehow changing the environment so that increased activity and movement and riding your bike to work becomes valued and encouraged. So we, be, you know, expend more energy and we have access to food that is uh, more healthy, that is not so calorically dense. Uh -huh. And start this at, uh, in childhood before before obesity becomes a problem very well doctor it looks Sorry like you have that's okay <laughs> it looks like you have some place to go thank you very much oh, thank you